Hi, I'm Peter Coppola, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, really had a wonderful, wonderful time with Matt. Uh, hopefully you uh, picked up some of the things that we were talking about. Uh, and remember, your hair is your most important accessory. So get a great haircut and leave the rest to us. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Digging In. Amazing, amazing guest today, Peter Coppola. He has an unbelievable background, but the thing about him, it's not what he's achieved, which is, is going to be interesting to hear about. It's what he started with. It's how he started. It's the fortitude. It's the creativity that he has inside of him. It's, it's the real depth of the story of where he came from and where he went. So, Peter, welcome. Welcome it's to great. the show. It, Matt, it's great to be here. I'm excited. This is really wonderful. It, it's it really it's amazing. So we talked for a while yes. you know, before the show started, and you know it's one thing to read about you, it's one thing to hear about you, but the key is like getting in and you know into your presence and feeling the energy. You're a super positive guy. You know you're fun to be around. I'm getting to see you now, and I can read about who you are now and what you've done. But here's the the, the biggest question I have: knowing you came from Harlem, knowing you had a, a tough tough start, right? Yes. Do you still feel like you're still that same little boy, even though you've achieved everything you've achieved? Are you still that 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 same person inside? I think usually everybody is. You know, you go back to your roots of where you came from. Um, and I, I grew up, you know, I was very lucky. I had great parents. Uh, I grew up in a great neighborhood. I mean, in those days, if you could imagine uh, living in a neighborhood where you, all your cousins, all your aunts, all your uncles lived all all in one little area, which was an incredible growing up that way. So I was very lucky that way. Yeah. It left something with you. So let's go back. I don't want to start with where you are now. I, I, I want to know, and people that are going to watch this, you know, they're, they need motivation. They need inspiration. They need to hear your story. So tell me about that, the beginning, and, and what inspired you, you know, to even take the path you took? Well, I knew at, at a very young age, and don't ask me why I knew that, but I just did, that I wanted to become something. I grew up in a neighborhood, a tough neighborhood. I had friends that, you know, got into trouble. And you didn't have anyone that you could look at and say, well, okay, I want to be like that person. Because I didn't really want to be like that person. So I knew at a, at a young age that I, I, I wanted to do something. Uh, I got into the music business. I became a drummer. Uh, yeah. That I didn't know. Yes. That's interesting. I was a drummer. I got very, very lucky. Uh, actually, uh, at 17 years old, I had to forge my birth certificate to get my cabaret card. And I got a job in the very famous Copacabana nightclub. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And that was kind of my foundation. At 17? At 17. Okay. Yeah. And that was kind of my foundation of meeting all of these people that I was in awe of, you know, I met Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Nat King Cole and Tony Bennett. I met all these people and I was a kid, you know, what, what did I know? But that was a great foundation for later on when I got into business of what to say, what not to say, how, how you should act, so far. So it was a really great opportunity for me as a young, young boy. And then I lived on 116th Street was where I grew up. Uh, and right across the street from where I lived was a little beauty parlor where two pretty, pretty girls, you know, worked. And so on the weekends, I would go and hang out with them, of course. And they would say to me, you know, Peter, you're very good at this. Why don't you go to beauty school? And of course, I said to myself, you got to be kidding me going to beauty school, you know. Wait, so you went there and you actually cut hair? I'm sorry. So you're, they said you're very good at this. You were actually. I would help out. Yeah. OK. I, I would help out in, in the salon, you know, okay. doing little odds and ends and things. And they they said, you know, you got a knack to this. Actually, my mother, believe it or not, God bless her, encouraged me to do this. She said, well, you know, you need a trade. You need to learn something. I don't like this nightclub thing. You know, my mother would wait up for me at night till I got home at three, four o'clock in the morning, you know, from from work. Yeah, yeah. So she didn't like it at all. So anyway, make a long story short, I, I decided to go to beauty school. But at that point, I made up my mind that if I was going to do this, I was going to be the best at it. That was kind of where I was at. Uh I got very, very lucky when I graduated. And I don't forget, this is 1965. Okay, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. 
I graduated a beauty school and a friend of mine came to me and they said, listen, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking for a job. He says, I'm working for a guy in New York on 57th Street and his name is Paul McGregor. Of course, nobody knew who Paul McGregor was. You know, if I said Paul McGregor. Paul McGregor was the guy that revolutionized the shag haircut. He created it. Anyway, I set up the interview and I, I go see Paul McGregor. Was, the building was 200 West 57th Street. He had a penthouse. Now I'm a young kid. I'm 20 something years old. I, I, I know nothing. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm exposed to this whole new world that just blew me away. I go for my interview and there is standing the most handsome guy I've ever seen, Paul McGregor in a three-piece suit, you know, Dunhill, I mean, unbelievable. And all these incredible women that I I never saw before. I mean, I never saw women like that before okay. in my I, life. I picked the right business. Yeah, I mean, it was like, <laughs> wow, wow, what, 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 it's like a new world. Anyway, uh, he sends his assistant over and she says, uh, are you here for the, the job? I said, yes. She said, well, could you go in the back room and Mr. McGregor will be right with you. Five hours later, he finally finishes what he's doing. He comes to me, he says, uh, and I'll never forget his first words to me. He says, so you want to be a hairdresser? I said, yeah. He said, okay, you got the job. 50 bucks a week. You start tomorrow morning, seven o'clock. Of course, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. But he taught me everything that I know today in the business. He was way ahead of his time. Before anyone else, he just had, a, he had an incredible spirit and he was a, an innovator. And I learned it. He was tough. He was very, very tough. I mean, he'd make you do a whole set and then he'd, he'd come home and say, what is that? Take all the rollers out you know, and do it over again in front of everybody. So, you know, but I, I took it and I said, okay, I'm going to learn here. This is, this is going to be my start. And I did. And it was the beginning of, of my career. And then, of course, it, it evolved uh, in the early 60s. Uh, Sassoon had come to Amer America, mm -hmm. which really changed everything. And I was very, very lucky. I knew, I knew a, a boy that was working for him. His name was John DeCuny. Now, you couldn't get into one of his classes. It was easy to get into the White House to get into one of Sassoon's classes. I mean, that's how it was hands off on everybody, unless you came with him to America. And I was so lucky to be in the right place at the right time because I met all those guys, mm. Paul Mitchell, uh, Roger Thompson, Christopher Pluck, Maurice Tidy. These were the guys that revolutionized the industry. When you saw that work, these, these were the hair stylists who did the work, not Sassoon, although Sassoon was the, he was the guy. Lovely. So you were right in the middle of it at exactly the right time. Yeah. 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 It, it the all right started. people at the right time. I was there very, was a revolution in that business. I was very, very lucky because it was a revolution in everything. Don't forget in the, the 60s, everything changed. Clothes changed, attitudes changed, music changed, hair changed. I mean... If you were in that world at that time, you were a rock star. Literally, you were a rock star because they took it so seriously. And I did because I was never exposed to that kind of focus. And, and it, it led me to the, the next step in business, which I learned that without clarity, without focus, without passion, you're just not going to get there. It's just not going to happen. And I taught myself that there was only one way to do this, that you had to sacrifice, that you had to be serious about what, what you do. I think and that, that's across the board with anything that you do in business or in life or in general, in partnerships and relationships. It's, it's all about being serious. Uh, and for me, it worked. Uh, Can you bring me back for a sec? So a few things. So your focus, passion, sacrifice. Earlier, you mentioned your parents, right? Growing up. Yes. I'm feeling like I'm hearing that that the fact that you were able to do that and then you know, you're working for somebody who's really tough on you, you've got a thick skin. Like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm hearing that that's going back to, to what you learned as a kid, right? To, to, have, to have that toughness. Is that, I mean, is there a connection there? Well, yeah. I mean, my father was tough, but, but he gave us a tremendous amount of love. But he was a serious guy, my father. It was different. He protected his children. 
but he, he was, you, you try to get that picture. He was just a very, very serious man. You couldn't fool around with him, that type of thing. He wasn't a guy that you pat him on the back. And he was a very serious man. And it kind of rubbed off on me as I grew up. I mean, I, was, I used to get a reputation as, you know, oh, Peter Coppola, you can't talk to him. You know, he, Come on. he's unapproachable because I was so serious about what I did. So I, I got a reputation that way, which was untrue. But it was because I was serious. You were about, focused. I was focused. Right. Yeah. So you know, it, there's, a, there's a thing that goes like this. Be careful of your thoughts because your thoughts become your words. Your words become your habit. Your habit becomes your passion. Your passion becomes your character. And your character becomes your destiny. So you, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a stepping stone in life. Uh, I think we mentioned it a little bit, which I truly believe. We're all born with a great gift, I believe, from God. And that's a creative spirit that you're born with. But how do you tap into it is the key. That's the key. How do you do that? And that's what separates you from everybody else. I, and I truly believe that. So in in anything, it could be in relationships, it could be in business, it could be whatever it may be, you know? I agree with you. And, and Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's hard to explain it to, to most people because it's almost like it's like somehow like pressed down or suppressed or something. But everybody does have that ability to, to, to see things that either nobody else sees. Sometimes I'll say like to see around the corner. Exactly. Right. Especially in business, to be able to see around the corner. It, it is it is inside everybody. Right. I so did. how do they how did how did how did you tap into that? Did you even need to? Was it natural for you? I, I think I learned uh, early on, and I mean early, uh, in my early 20s, that you cannot let outside interference. You can't be distracted. Yeah. You pay a price for it, by the way. It's not easy, but you do. Uh, it, and if, if you have clarity in your life, if you know where you're going and you don't let the inside influence interrupt that, you got a good shot at it. But most people can't do that because they they... They let outside interference, you know, it's called life, you know, life, you got this, you got that, you got bills, you have obligations. Yes, we all have that, but you can't let that, those outside influences interfere with you, where you're going. And if you do, you're just never going to get there. And, That's and, priceless. That's priceless because so it's a noise. There's noise. There's constantly well, noise. It's yeah, your family, it's your wife, it's your kids. It's, it's always something, you know. And one could be seen as antisocial, one could be seen as too focused, it could be seen as a lot of things that are perceived as negative, when it's really you're just focused on your passion, on your goals, you're determined, and you just want to make something happen. But goals that's, that's are so important, minority. Matt. I mean, goals in life are so important. It, it puts you on the right journey. And listen, there's going to be repercussions when you decide to take that journey. There always is. There's always going to be something or somebody but you, it's, you can't let that interfere. And it's hard. That's that determination. Well, if you well, know yeah. where you're going, and so actually I think it's easier for people that start with less to be focused on, because partially you kind of want to change where you came, at least for me, when I wanted to change where I came from and, and have a different life and knowing that I wanted a different life for my future wife and kids and, and, and for myself, there is a goal. Like there, there is a goal to just live a different life. People confuse, I think, themselves with, with success. It's not financial. It's not. Trust it's me. It's fun to have money. Well, but that is not success. Money does only two things for you, by the way. Say this slow. I, I've been poor and I've been rich. So money does only two things for you. It doesn't buy you happiness for the most part. No way. It doesn't buy you health. It doesn't buy you love for the most part. You know, in certain areas, yes. But, <laughs> That's but, a different show. Yeah. But, but it, 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 it doesn't buy you any of these things. It only gives you two things, money. It gives you security, and it gives you the opportunity to tell everybody to go to hell when you have money. That's all it does. What about fun? It gives you the ability to have... Fun to for be me, comfortable and have fun. Yeah, fun for me is work. I agree with you. I mean, that's really, yeah, my, yeah. That's really my fun. Yeah. Uh, but when people think about success, pe people usually think about money, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not the money, it's health, it's happiness, 
it's being fulfilled. If you have a passion, you have goals, like that's happiness. Like you're feeling like you've done something. Yeah. Being creative is like, the reason I do this show is to help other people, but that's a creative outlet also. Right? Well, that's yeah. a very fulfilling thing. I think people that are in the arts are very, very fortunate. Uh, it's a gift. You know, if you're a, if you're a painter, if you're an architect, I wanted to be I wanted to be an architect. If you're uh, if you're a musician, those are different kinds of people. By the way, they they have another gift inside of them, and they're different. They're different than other people. People who do what I do, they're different because it's 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 the creative spirit again yeah. that takes control of who you are. They That's, also feel the world differently. Well, of course, you look at things differently. Very emotional. They can oh, yeah, feel things. Yeah. They can see colors that other people yeah, don't yeah. see. I went to acting school for, for a couple of years when I realized that I needed work. Peter needed work. I mean, I grew up, you know, I didn't know anything. I really didn't. So a friend of mine said, listen, why don't you go to acting school? You'll learn something at acting school. And I did. You learn, you learn that, other, that other world. Uh, that's kind of different. You meet different kinds of people. Uh, kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and I went to the actor studio for a while, and I met you know a couple of famous people there. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I which bet. I, which again was very very interesting. At you what know? age was that? I'm sorry. At what age was that? I was uh, 27. Okay. So this is right around the same time you were trying to figure it all out. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I knew early on that I needed help. I needed diction. I needed to be around people. I needed to to you know what to say, what not to say. You, you I needed that kind of education, which I did not have. But I realized that if I wanted to succeed, these were some of the things that I had to do. So you're an innovator, which we know, and you're a creator, which we know, right? So. All these things that were happening when you were in your mid twenties, yeah, were all it was like you didn't you, you didn't you didn't have the the destination wasn't laid out for you, but you were creating your you were innovating with yourself, you were finding things out about yourself, which is still innovation, exactly, right? So I think I I, I was think, growing within myself, you were, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So bring me back to that point. I think that's where we, we were before. So you were you you had the opportunity, right, to work with I think Peter. You said. Paul oh, McGregor. Paul, Paul, another yeah, P with yeah, Paul. Yeah. And he gave you a job. He was he tough gave, on he, you. He, he, he liked me, even though he was, he was a tough, tough guy, tough taskmaster. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, he was very serious. I yeah. mean, and that's kind of rubbed off on me a little bit also. But you were used to that anyway. Your dad was like that. So it wasn't anything unusual to you. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, you're, you're in a different world. Yeah. You're, you're exposed to something that is, is new to you. The sure. people, the surroundings, the, the art, all of that. Uh, I was very lucky because he came to me one day. I really got into the work uh, because of the classes at Sassoon. Don't forget, there was only a handful of us who knew how to cut hair that way. And in those days, I don't know if you even know this, uh, a man could not go into a salon and get a haircut. It was illegal. Literally illegal. I mean, this is in the 60s. This was in the 60s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is in New York. Well, all of this was in the 60s. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and that changed. We fought that case and yeah. we won the case in New York Supreme Court because it was unconstitutional. But these were all the changes that were happening that... So you were, you were responsible for that. Yes, we were. Paul Mitchell it. and I. Yeah. We won the case. He was yeah. a terrific guy, by the way. Yeah. A, a very creative guy. A innovative guy. But he got involved in bad stuff, you know, mm -hmm. unfor un unfortunately. But Paul came to me one day. He said, listen, my brother has this new salon on Long Island, a place called Great Neck Long Island. I said, never heard of Great Neck Long Island in my life. I said, yeah, well, what, what, do, what would you like me? He says, you need to go out there for a couple of weeks and show them all the new haircuts. Now, this was his clientele that came to New York. I said, I really don't want to this do that. This is Paul McGregor. Paul McGregor, okay. yeah. I said, I really don't want to do that, Paul. I said, I want to stay in New York with you. He said, you're going to be with me. Don't worry. But just go out there for a couple of, couple of weeks and show them all the new haircuts. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I didn't even have a car. I didn't own a car. I had no money. I was making a few bucks, you know. And uh, my brother loaned me a couple of dollars to, uh, I bought his old Oldsmobile to, to, go out, to go out to Long Island. 
Anyway, I go out to Long Island, and in a matter of a couple of weeks, I got so busy. I mean, like, really busy. Because we were doing all these new new haircuts. I mean, it was like really wild. We were doing something different, and, and all of a sudden, boom. Uh, overnight. I mean, it happened so quickly. It was like overnight. And you stayed there. Well, I, I stayed there for a little while, but then I said to him, listen, when am I coming back to New York? He said, listen, just stay there for a little long. He kept telling me, stay there. And every time I just got so busy, I couldn't leave. I got that crazy. And of course, I started making money. You know. So you're bringing that money in, but it's still his business. Still his business. Were you starting to think about that? Well, here's what happened. Paul Mitchell already had the vision and he would talk to me about it. He said, you know, the industry is going to change, Peter. There's going to be this whole new thing. Even Sassoon was still traditional, believe it or not, even though the cuts were different. And it was all about the haircut then in, in, in those days. And everybody, if you were in, like I said, if you were in that world, everybody took it very, very seriously. I mean, you were like up there. <clears throat> so that was a huge advantage for me. Paul's brother comes to me, he says, listen, why don't we buy this salon, you and I? And of course, Paul doesn't want it anymore. He's already moving on to the next level, which he did. He opened a place called McGregor's Garage, which exploded. 50 hairdressers. I mean, it was like, you couldn't believe it, which kind of inspired me. But still, no one, no one made the move really into the haircutting business. It was still traditional beauty parlors. I got to ask you a question. So you, he taught you, yeah, certain, he did. but Ta he also taught these other people that, that these 50 people. So yeah. there was something special about what Paul was doing. Oh, very special. That you picked, that you learned. Yeah. That people loved. Yeah. So he really is a, is a big innovator. And, I he mean, created, underneath he, it. He created, believe it or not, he created a duplicate of himself with me. That's what I, I'm getting at. That's I wanted to be like him. He was right. my mentor. I wanted to be like right. Paul McGregor. Of course, first of all, this guy was so good looking. He was handsome. He walked down the street. People would stop and look at him. And he was, you know, three-piece Dunhill suit. I mean, he was like, wow. He was like, wow. So uh, he teaches you, puts you out there. It's exploding. Yes. You're realizing, okay, something big is happening. Here. Oh, yeah. No, no. I knew, right? I knew early on right away. And I wasn't encouraged by it, by the way. I was discouraged because I was so busy doing this. And everybody said, well, Peter, you're not going to give up all of this to do something that you know, you're not sure about because everybody thought it was going to be a fad, you know, the hair cutting thing. It's going to come and go, you know, it's not going to take over the beauty business. But you but had a feeling. I knew that it was going to. That's the noise we were talking about. That's yeah. that's that's um, exactly. other people's opinions who haven't even done it, who haven't taken the risks, who haven't tried, who haven't failed yeah. or succeeded or telling you what you should do. I had nothing really to look at to compare it to. Yeah. Even though Paul was moving forward, you know, he already was advanced in, 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 in his mind, but he still hasn't made the move yet. So what did you have to lose for trying? What did you have to lose? Uh, no, nothing. So Didn't you matter. took the risk. I, was a, I took the risk. We spoke about that a little bit. You got to take the risk. Without the risk, there's nothing. And you were still in your 20s. I'm still in my 20s. I'm a young I mean, kid. perfect. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I remember sitting with a client, I'll never forget this, as long as I live. Her name was Laura Gartenberg. I'll never forget it. She was a lovely, lovely lady, beautiful woman. And I'm talking to her in the salon, and I, I want to explain to her, you know, how much I appreciate everything that's happening to me. And I say to her, you know, I say, you, you people are just so, so wonderful. She stopped me dead. She says, what did you say? I said, you people are, are wonderful. She said, Peter, use people. It stuck with me forever. It stuck with me. She said, Peter, you got some work to do. She liked me. She wanted to see me become successful. She was a lovely, lovely lady. That's when I went to acting school. After you took that, it that seriously, what she said to you. Yeah, I took, I took it really seriously. Because she, she constructively criticized me, which was okay and taught me something that I did not know. And I was okay with it. I wanted to learn. This is the uncommon stuff. This is why I like talking to people like you because that's a self-awareness. Yes. Most people, first of all, they don't want to look at themselves and do it and improve on things. Yeah. You heard something, you're like, okay, that's a piece of this equation. Like I need to get this worked out. And you actually went and did something. That's uncommon. Well. It's common among people who, who achieve things and who reach their goals. Well, yeah. 
but not so common among, and it's a very valuable lesson. You know, constructive criticism is valuable if you take it as that. You but know? you know, you know what I, Matt, what I appreciated so much that she took the time. She, she could have, she, yeah, she could, she could, like, what did she care? But she took the time. She said, you know, Peter, yeah. you, you, you can, she says, you're going to be famous. Wow. I said, wow, what? She said, Peter, you're going to be famous. You're going to be famous. What do you think she saw? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Still don't know. I don't know. I really don't know, but she said it and it, yeah. stu and it stuck with me, but she took the time to say, That's interesting. you know, it, it, well, yeah. I'm hearing a theme that, and I'm sure it's going to continue. It's, you have an awareness, but there's also a certain way you communicate and, there, and there's, there's things that you keep, you keep bringing up um, about your own need to improve. You see something, you go, you see something, you go. And you said it a few times already. You know, I, 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 well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful yeah. for what has happened to me, especially from where I came from. I, I, till today, and I'm doing it now. I celebrate this year 50 years, 50 years in the beauty business. Uh, I don't want to say I've seen it all because I don't think anybody sees it all, but I've seen a lot, a lot. Uh, I've opened 30 salons in my career. Uh, and I just opened up a new one in uh, in Boca Raton, okay. yeah. uh, in, in uh, Boca Senna, which is a spectacular salon, which I'm inviting you to come to see. It's, it's really unbelievable. I'm going to come, not for a haircut, but I'm going <laughs> I'm 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 to come talk to you there. But it's it's a, a video. It, it was an exciting project. Yeah. And even this project, friends of mine would say to me, Peter, you, you're not going to do this, are you? I said, I, I sure am going to do it because it really is a spectacular place. It's the largest salon in South Florida. I have 30 hairdressers. I mean, it's... That's a perfect segue to, are you teaching them the same thing you were taught? Exactly. Has it been the same model? Yeah. Okay. What is it about that? Not just, I don't mean tactically. I don't mean the how. I mean, what is it about the feeling that people get? Because you're talking about you had to learn how to maybe just treat people a certain way. You, at the Copacabana, you saw how to treat people a certain way. You mentioned before. It's more than just a haircut. It's an experience. Oh, well, you know, it, right? it's, I'm still trying to figure out how to instill passion into people. How do I get there? What could I say to you that'll, that'll inspire you that you're going to want to do this, that this is the most important thing in your life? Because for me, it was the most important thing in my life. How do I get from here to here was my goal. You know, and it's and you know we hear about this all 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 the time. I go to I go to many seminars. Like I love Deepak Chopra. You know who he is? I listen to him all the time. Okay, I went to a seminar. I do his his meditations. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. Yeah. I went to a couple of his seminars, but not too long ago. I went yeah. to a seminar in Miami, yeah. and there must have been about a thousand people. And he's talking, and he's uh, he said, you know, in in midlife. You need a change of heart. So like everybody's looking around at each other. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, what, you know, I raised my hand. And I said, you know, doctor, can you, what you do know, you mean? Yeah, what, what does that mean? He said, well, I'm glad somebody wants to know what that means. He said, in midlife, you need a change of heart. And that means in order to have a wonderful life, and this really hit me. You have to give up the life that you had planned in order to have the life that's waiting for you. He said, and there's a great life waiting for you, but you have to give up the life that you had planned. Ooh, I said, ooh, that's a little heavy. But he's right. It's, it's, it's acceptance. Well, yeah. I mean, we all have our plan, yeah. whatever that may be. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. But whatever that is, at 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 well, with him, it was at midlife. So if you're 50 or 60 years old, you can reinvent yourself. I've reinvented myself. I can't tell you how many times. And it's just, it's, it's looking at where you are at the moment. You learned that in acting school, by the way. You're, you're living for the moment. You know, it's like when, you, when people say point to yourself, where do you point? You point here to your heart. So it's, you got to listen to these things. That's true. That's true. That's right. When you point That's to yourself, you point to your heart. So you got to listen to these things. Your, your inner id, 
will tell you where you're going. Now, it's hard to get there, but it'll tell you where you're going. Your gut never lies to you. You BS yourself, but your, 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 your gut doesn't lie to you. It's like, it's like being in a place where you know something is wrong. You're uncomfortable. You shouldn't be there. That's your listen to it. You listen to you listen it. Well, to some it. people don't. They get it's in, wisdom. They get well, yeah. It's well, wisdom. it's all of that, but and they get into trouble because they're not listening to it. You know, it means a lot to listen to your gut. There's a whole conversation there too. Yeah. Oh, you, listen. You I mean, you go, have life experiences. You've got the logical side of things. You have the intellectual. Yeah, you got yeah. the emotional. You got yeah. everything coming together. It just so happens that you feel it here, but it's your, your brain. Is sending the message here. You know, it's it's the old you need saying. The awareness. You know, Matt, it's the old saying. The human species knows we're 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 incredible. We are very complicated. We're the most complicated thing in the world, as if you look into yeah, it. Sure. When you do something wrong, you know that you're doing something wrong because it doesn't make you feel good. It doesn't make you feel good. You could BS yourself and say, "Well, you know." No, no, no. You know you're doing something wrong because when you do something right, it makes you feel good. good. It makes you feel whatever that is. It makes you feel good. So you know the balance. You you have a choice. Everybody has a choice in life. What is the choice? That's interesting. Who who are you? Is really I ask myself that almost every day. Peter, who are you? A little complicated, but who are you? Why are you here? Why are you here? You know there are two things. I've wait, heard. Wait, what's the answer you come up with? Well, there there are two things in life that are very very important. It may be the most important thing: the day that you're born, and the day that you find out who you are. Very few people, very few people find out who they are. Why? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. They get in their own way. I search. They don't want to know. Well, it, it could be many. Could you imagine things. what they would find out? Or they have too much going on here. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. You're in the minority. A lot of people. This, this is really good stuff. This is. I didn't expect the conversation to go here. This is. This is. I spent a lot of time on this. This stuff. Um, you pointed out the change of heart. I'm 49. About two years ago, I went through my own process for a year and a half, and actually, one of the books I read talked about a change of heart. And it's real. It is some. It's something that's Matt, true. It's real. I think it's the most important thing in a person's life. You find your purpose that way. Absolutely, no question about it. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because it changes. It becomes for me the journey of having you know growing up the way that I grew up, and then being on this journey to, to have money. I reach a point where I realize, wow, what that was a waste of time. Money's a <laughs> money's a byproduct. That's all it is, really. I wasn't yeah. happy. No. So then the end result was. I discovered what it was I really needed to be doing. In fact, the show this is about it's about it's about helping people. It's, you have you know, I, have a, I think others, I mentioned you know? to I have a son right now who's in who's in Croatia. Croatia yeah. He's only twenty nine years old. Yeah. He's a minister. He found he found his light in God. I miss him terribly. I cry sometimes because I really miss him. But this is this is he found himself. This is what he wants to do. How wonderful that is. My God. I mean, when you think that's about it. That's what you could hope for, for your children. Exactly. That they're feeling that satisfied yeah. and that fulfilled. You know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. You're hoping for yourself that you find yourself. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the percentage is, what, 80-something percent that most people go through life and they don't know who they are. Never. They don't know who and they it's are. It's sad, really. Well, it is sad. It is sad. I want to bring you back for one second. Go ahead. To how you with the people that you bring on to work in your organization, how you get them to find that passion. You mentioned that before. You want them to have the passion. You can't, I don't think you can teach passion. I you think, can expose them to ideas. Uh, I try to have a meeting once a month with my people. I have a huge staff of, of people and people that have been with me for years that are still with me. And I make it a policy to try to uh, get them on the right path. Which, which for some is difficult. They have issues. They have life problems. They have emotional problems. They have drug problems. I mean, you know, there's o there's always something out there. And we've been through it. I've been through it. I mean, I, I could write a book, and I am. I'm writing a book at, at, at the moment. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get it done. It's going to be a great book. I hope so. And it's going to be a good movie. I, I, I hope so. I, I, I hope so. Um, you know, we, we only pass here. It's a very short period of time. Yeah. 
how, how do you want to be remembered is, is another focal thing in my life. Uh, how do you want to be remembered? Is it important to you? You know, how about your family? How about your children? How do they see you? Uh, uh, were you a good father? Were you a good provider? Were you there for them when they needed you? All of these things, as you get older, start creeping into your head. So it becomes, it becomes a factor, you know? Uh, and even today, I mean, I still have goals. I'm, I'm creating a new product line. You know, I'm, there's, I don't stop because I, I, tomorrow, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I mean, you know, life at its best is, un, is, 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 is complicated. <laughs> you know, we don't know. I'm talking to you right now. I have no idea what I'm going to say to you. I don't. We're talking. Perfect. But you know what I'm saying? We're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, I don't know. What I do know is I, I will not allow anything negative to interfere with my life. I just won't do it. And you pay a price for that. You do. Because uh, most people won't accept that from you. They, they don't like it. Because I won't let anybody in that I believe is going to interfere with me being happy. I won't let it happen. And you can sense it as soon as you meet somebody. Well, yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. yeah. They're energy vampires. They suck the energy out of you. Well, they do, yeah. Yeah. And even at the meetings, I'll say, whatever is negative in your life, I don't care what it is or who it is, you got to get rid of it. Because it's only going to take you down. So they're going to toxic. Well, if it doesn't work, yeah, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. Wow. And it, and and I related all of the, what I'm talking to you. I related it into business because it's been my whole life is business. I think that's that's if you want to call it success or whatever it may be. That's what's made me successful. That I won't let these things interfere with business. So we talked, I think, earlier about pride and respect. Um, and what you do, which you, I think you mentioned you learned that also from your parents. I mean, it was a certain, my, 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 but you're bringing it to everything. My mom do. and dad were, were, the, were the best people I, I, I've ever met in my whole life. I had, I, I was so fortunate to have a great mother and father that they really positive? cared. They really cared. Was your mom positive, like, like the way you are? My mother. She was positive. Like, oh, my mother. Your energy to be around you was very positive. Yeah, my mother was unbelievable. Yeah. Strong, strong lady, yeah. tough, hardworking. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like you. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so you're passing this on to to generation after generation. Anybody who comes to work with you, you get and they can they can experience you. Maybe not. Maybe now you're not so one on one with people because it's a big organization. But as you were coming up, twenties, thirties, forties, and you were doing your thing, you were you were actually carrying the torch for uh, Paul. In yeah. a way, you were carrying on the scene. I mean, really. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So he's been gone. Is he, is he still alive? He, he, he passed away. Okay. Yeah. Did he did he know you were like carrying on this? this? I'm going to tell you something. I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. But there was a time in my career where I surpassed him. You yeah, know? but he probably was proud of you. I mean, he, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, hopefully he was. I, I, I believe that he was. But, but it, 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 it affected me. It, it did. It affected you that you, you passed him by uh, in, as in, far as the business. In the business. business in yeah. business. Well, in what bu do you mean it affected you? Um, there, were, there were so many ways that I wanted to say thank you to him yeah. for what has happened to me. Even talking right now, I get emotional about it. I can feel it, actually. I do. Yeah. Because, because if it wasn't for him, I don't know where I would be. He, he, Did you had, ever tell him he, had, he had that kind of influence over me. And then to reach a point in my life where I was bigger than him, and I was, it it, it affected me. Did he know that though? Did you ever yeah, tell he, him that? he he knew it. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome that you had the opportunity to, to actually say that. To him. Yeah, because the words matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And so you did the same thing with other people. Have you ever had people come to you that have worked with you that have told you that that you've had that effect on them? In in a roundabout way, I mean, there were there were people that that are are major players in my business now. That started out with me, sweeping floors, assistants that are big names today. You know, Kevin Mancuso, Oscar Blondie, Sally Herzberger, 
I mean, Sally Herzberger now gets $1,000 for a haircut. I know it's hard to believe, but she does. But how does that make you feel? It, it makes me feel that's, great. That's it. Yeah, that's, it does. You no, know, it makes you feel great. It does. You change people's lives. Yeah. I don't want to talk about the people whose hair you come. Like you change yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And, and, but all, and, see, these people, interesting, as we're talking, they had that creative spirit inside of them. Those people. They had it to begin with. Yes, absolutely. And you were able to, to give them a, a canvas. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I like that. They, yes, exactly. So to I, discover it, what they actually maybe wouldn't have known if, if they didn't meet you. You know. Well, they, they when they started me, they were young. But I saw that in them. And, and I... I encouraged them. I said, listen, you guys have an opportunity to take it to the next level. If you listen to me, listen to me, and I'll take you to the next level. And they listen because right. they, they knew. They the saw history it. repeating itself. I mean, well, you were told that something similar, and then you told yeah, somebody else. Yeah. It's so, brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's, it's, uh, it, at times, it's overwhelming. It really is. Because I've seen it. I've seen how people can, can evolve when... They have the passion when they focus and when they have the discipline, which is, you know, I, I, there are three things that I live with. Desire, dedication, discipline. I call them the three D's of life. If you could follow those three things, you have a shot at it. And you do. But you you can't deviate from it. You can't BS yourself and say, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm, you know. No, 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 no. You, you got to give your soul to it. And if you do, you got a shot. And you see people that think they've got it. They, they try, and they, then they just they don't. They just can't. No, very few, believe it or not. Because it does come from here. I think so. I think I, it's not. It's not intellectual. You can't. You, no, you, it's something. I, I, it's hard to describe, but it, it's a certain way of being. It's just who you are. If you could look in the mirror, and I do once in a while, if you could look in the mirror and and really take yourself seriously. <laughs> there's, there's a lot there's a lot to that by the way but if you can do that if you could look in the mirror and take yourself seriously uh that changes everything about who you are well i live my life like that yeah. I, and i do and of course it, d discipline being being the most difficult uh which most people don't have they don't yeah. they, they don't have the discipline uh and it doesn't even so have true. to be. It doesn't so even true. have to be with business. It's just life in general. People don't uh, don't have the discipline to to realize that uh, in order to achieve anything, you're going to pay a price. I don't care who you are. You, there's, you're going to pay. You're going to pay the price. You know. I remember when I got into the business, and I got married. Uh, my marriage didn't work because of who I was. I was never home. It was about the business. That was before the change of heart. Yeah, I couldn't balance that relationship. Yeah, and you know, it just couldn't do it. And so and you, you you were focused on, on on something specific. Yeah, and I would not let any anything interfere yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, which which some people could say, well, you're being selfish. Well, I don't look at it that way. I look at that if you have a goal in life, whatever it may be. You know, I, I relate to some people too. Let's you, let's take somebody who's very wealthy, they have a lot of money, yet they give up themselves. And you say, well, wait, why are you going through this? You got all the money in the world. You can you know, go enjoy yourself. Well, they are enjoying themselves. It's not about the money. It's about who they are, you know? It really does come down to that, you know? And selfish, it's a matter of perspective. Like you're saying, it's a matter of perspective. It's, timing you know and, and so for you those people around you at that time maybe they felt that way but what you did was right for you it was right for you at that time you know well you have a choice everybody has a choice what is it i believe listen we all start off with a clean slate everybody does mm -hmm. then you make the choices in your life well th those are your choices if you're lucky mm -hmm. enough to have someone whispering in your ear to guide you, oh, well, you're lucky. And, and, and they're a good person and they believe in you and they want to see you do good in life. They want to see you successful. Uh, 
I, I still don't know what the word success really means because it's, it, it, it's so different to, to so many people. Money, uh, fame, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it. For me, it's what makes me happy. I just want to be happy because that, for me, that's, that's, that's success. I want to be happy. And if I could help someone, terrific. That makes me even happier. What a wonderful joy to take something and make it better. Wow, that's when did you realize that? Was it always like that? I, I learned that at a very young age. I did. That's uncommon. Usually it takes people 40, 40 50 years to realize it's about that. Because it is about that. I think a lot of it was where I grew up, the things I've seen. I mean, I saw things that I can't even talk about. So I, I realized that as, as a young boy, that this was not going to be for Peter. I didn't want this, you know, I just didn't, I didn't want it. What, what I, and I, till today, I don't know what that is. What made me think that way? Because I had, I had friends, I had, you know, I grew up in this world. So I don't know what, what triggered that other than the things I, I saw that w were not good. I didn't want to grow up that way. And I wanted to make something of myself. I wanted to be somebody. I didn't know what that was at the time. And it, whatever it was, I would go to the movies and I'd watch, you know, I watch, you know, Gary Cooper in High Noon, you know, and say, you know, like, wow, you know, I was influenced by all of these little things that changed how I thought about life, about things or about who I wanted to be. Did your parents live, you know, to a, in a certain age where they saw you being what they would consider successful? Well, yeah, I brought my parents down to, to Florida. They were still living in New Oh, they lived a long life. They, yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah. they got to see everything. My 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 mother and father saw everything. They couldn't believe it. I how'd that feel for you? It was interesting. I bought this big house on Long Island. It was a big house. Yeah. And I was I didn't want to tell my mother and father how much I paid for that. You felt guilty. I, I felt guilty. So I never told them how much I paid for the house. Did they, they ask they, you? They would never get it. They wouldn't understand it. They would say, "Are you what? Are you kidding?" So it was that kind of it was that kind of thing. But they saw my success. My father was uh, overwhelmed by it, even though he was successful in his world. They, were, they had a fabulous restaurant in New York. They were very successful, very hardworking people. That's another thing I got from from them. They were they were they were hardworking people, and it rubbed off on me. Although I never looked at my work as work, because I enjoyed because it. Because so you enjoyed it, it was a passion. I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. It wasn't work. It wasn't work. It wasn't like going to work on construction. You go to work on construction. You're working. Yeah. This was a this was a joy. It wasn't a job. It was your, a joy. Your parents came from you said Sicily. Is that what you said? Naples. Naples. So they so they they knew a very different life when they came here. So they had to. Work I was hard. able. I was able to take them to Italy, to where they was born. That was that 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 was yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was able to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I wow. I, I I learned that that um, that kind of uh, respect and honor from my parents. They instilled that in me. Now you so you your kids grew up in a very very different environment. They grew up. How privileged. did you teach your kids? Yeah. What you just said to me, all these things you've just said to me, I could read you an entire page of words you just gave me. Yeah. How did you teach your kids that? Because it I, sounds like you have two very good kids. They they saw how their father lived, and they saw how their father treated their mother, and that says it all. Believe it or not, yeah. This is, this and they grew up in a privileged privileged life. I mean, you know, they had it. They they still do. <laughs> That's what I mean. When it, they could very easily be detached from. Yeah. how most people live, yeah. especially where we live down here in Boca. It's not real. The I think, rest of the country is not like this. No, I, I think that if you show your children love, yeah. if you show your children respect, that you respect them, yeah. that they know that they're there, you're there for them, uh, that says a lot. And and I shouldn't say most parents. I'm listening, most parents love their children, but sometimes they don't know how to express it. And they also see how how you treat people. Oh, how yeah. you talk to people, how people experience you. So it, it's a great it's movie. Really There's a great movie I watch quite often, believe it or not. What is it? Called, uh, it's about Shangri-La. Okay. Um, with Ronald Coleman, uh, Lost Horizon. Okay. 
okay. is the movie. And there's a scene in that movie uh, where he meets the, the Dalai Lama up, up in the mountains there. And uh, he wants to let him be take over when he dies. And he's already 200 years old. And he says to him, all I want you to do is be kind. Just be kind. And I, I hear that all the time. Be kind. It's easy. It's hard to be a bitch. You know, it's you got you to work at it. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. But, but if you're kind, it's easy. Just be kind. And I try to do that every day. Be kind. There's something else about you that I've picked up on and it, since I've been talking with you. So I'm going to ask you a question to connect it to this one word. Obviously, you've done well in business, very well. Um, you've met a lot of people who are who are well known, who are celebrities. Oh my God! Yeah, um, I, th I think some some probably uh, very famous people, right? You're a humble guy. If you 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 come off as a very humble guy, how, how did you not lose that along the way? And am I am I misreading you? I mean, no, you're, you're no. a humble guy. I try to be. Um... I, I think that, you know, somebody asked me once, what, what, what is it that you don't like? And it, it always comes to me, uh, injustice is a, is a terrible thing. You know, you, uh, that's something I can't deal with. Or, or, you know, taking advantage of someone because you, you're in a better position or you have the power. Take the power and use it in a constructive way. It has always been my kind of my journey, w w where to go, because it makes me feel good, makes me happy to d to do that. And it, I guess I guess most people, well, with let's say with me, I I just if I could do something good for somebody, I'm going to do it. Because what does it mean? It's no, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. People make a big deal about it, you know. Well, I did, did. Come on, are you kidding me? If if you were lucky enough in life, okay to be in the position that you're in, regardless of, of what the reasons are, and you could help someone else. It's the best thing in the world. Absolutely, 100%. Why, why wouldn't, you, it, why wouldn't you, know, you want to do that? There's no question. Yeah. Was this, you described your dad as a guy who was um, quiet. I forget how you actually described him, but I feel like, was this how your mom was? Like all the things you're talking about, did, you, did all this stuff really, this was just the way you, it was for you? Well, it's the way I grew up. Yeah. Yeah, I keep going back to that because like it, it's it all comes back to the same thing. You didn't get lost along the way. Maybe you did. Maybe there's. I'm sure there's plenty of stories. I but did. I, I I did. I mean, I went through. I went through that bad period of time where success uh, influences you to do things that uh, you know you want to show everybody how successful you are. You know, I was I was 28 years old, driving around with a Rolls well, Royce. Kids still. I mean, all, all that yeah. stuff. You know. Uh, Wait, say that again. I was, yeah, You're twenty. Rolls at twenty eight. Okay, that's interesting. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, twenty eight and have that. That that it's it's a twenty eight year old ego. Well, you it's ego. It's, it's you ego. haven't lived your life yet. You don't even know how to how to. I wanted to show everybody that I I I became successful. Wait, that happened in two years. Yeah, we skipped over that about an hour ago. Yeah, I didn't, my I success didn't, happened to me very very quickly. Yeah, I mean overnight. I mean literally overnight. Because I was just there, I, I I I was just in that place. And you were still in the neighborhood. Um, you were still in the neighborhood. Oh yeah, with the rolls. Yeah, I was still on 116th Street, living with my parents. Yeah, they had their they had a brownstone building. I mean, they were successful, believe it or not, in their little right. their their little world. Uh, f f for them, your book is going to be unbelievable. When you write I, this, I hope when so. you write this book, <laughs> are you going to go into like really all the stories? I mean, we didn't talk about any failures. I didn't ask you about that. So it, it sounds like your, your your story is nothing but success, but that's not possible. No, it's not. It's, it's not. I, I, I what been... was the biggest failure you had you had to recover from? Say that again? The biggest failure that you can remember that you had to recover from. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh I had I had five or six salons already going at one time on Long Island, and I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, I really With the did. rolls. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, the big house, the yeah. parties, uh, 
all the things that you fall into the traps, you know. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that they were traps. I just wanted to, hey, I'm here, you know, type thing. So I decided to open my first salon in Manhattan. And I didn't do my homework. Because I thought I was hot shit, excuse my English. You thought wherever you went, it would just be fantastic. Well, everybody led me to believe that. I mean, you know, you accumulate a lot of parasites. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're They're when, all living off of it. Of yeah. course. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I opened my first salon in Olympic Towers, which was the Aristotle Onassis building. I mean, I picked the best location in Manhattan, opened up the most gorgeous salon. But I didn't know the mentality of those people in Manhattan, the hairstylists, you know, that world. I wasn't exposed to that world. And it was a completely different world. Even though I started there, but I had left it. So when I went back, I didn't do my homework. Now, it wasn't a complete failure, but it, it taught me a lesson. I was disappointed in myself, which I never was before. And I said, okay, Peter. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I said, okay, okay, Peter. You, you're going to go back to Long Island now with your tail between your legs. You're going to do your homework. And one day you'll come back to New York. So that was the only time in my life where I, I learned a lesson that if, when you lose focus, when you lose discipline, when you think you're hot shit, okay, it's going to come and bite you on the butt. That was a great lesson for me. That really is because the humble guy that I'm talking to right now that's part of, of staying there. Those lessons kind of, well, don't forget who you are. Like, well, don't forget. Let's not get carried away with this. Yeah. You need, yeah. That's really I forgot, important. I forgot who I was. Yeah. I let outside influences come in. Yeah. Which, which I, I realized you never let that happen again. So you were cutting hair during, you, were you actually cutting hair during this time? Oh yeah. Okay. I still cut hair. So, we, we you, listen, I go, I get my head buzzed once a week. Yeah. And I sit and talk to my barber up the street here, and he knows everything that's going on. You must have heard some unbelievable stuff over the years. That, that book, that book could be a good book. The stuff that you've, that you've, that you've, well, heard the book, from the people. book I'm writing is about the beauty industry. Yeah. Where it started. Yeah. Where it like is. A history, like a documentary. And where it's going. Yeah. And right now it's not in a good place because people don't take it seriously. That's my problem with the beauty industry right now. When you first got into it, it was mostly women, right? Mostly women. Did you have any pushback? Did you have any, anything go like, where, like, why are you getting into this? You're a guy. Guys don't do this. Did that ever like, well, come at you that way? Uh, a little, a little bit, but you know, what's interesting about men in certain businesses. That's not my opinion, by the way. I'm just no, asking no, no, you no, if, no. if people thought that. There's a, oh, yes. But if you look at if you look at uh, famous chefs, there are no women famous chefs. That's true. There are men. All your famous chefs are men. If you look at famous hairdressers, there are no women famous hairdressers. They're all men. That's true. Of course. And in, and in, and and uh, if you look at famous artists, there are no there are no famous painters. Women painters. And men. Now why is that? Van Gogh, you know, uh, these are men. Why is it? Well, I, I think it's, um, there's a separation between men and women. We are completely different, completely different. And I love women, don't get me wrong, but they're, but they're, they're, they're a different species than, than a man, completely different. Women are smarter than men. They only let us believe that we're smart. <laughs> But they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and their makeup is completely different. I mean, women make babies. They're completely different. If you understand that, you could be very successful with women. But most men don't, don't go down that road because of yeah, the, you know, yeah. the macho thing. Yeah. I've never been macho with women. No. Because I, un I, I try to understand them. And they are completely different than men. They are. It's part of my success, by the way. I do believe that. 
you reached a certain point, which was at what age and around what time, what, what year or so? Like, where did you, when did you get to a certain point where this thing was just big? Like there was a QVC. Oh, let's talk about QVC for a second. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. So where was that in, in this in this timeline? I became very very. Uh, I let me put it this way, I, I, and I I don't want to say it that, that it comes out the wrong way. I could have retired at thirty five. You're not wired to retire. Though. Well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I could have. Could have. I, yeah, I, I, I had enough. What would you do? Well, I kept working. Right. I, you know, but but, but physically, I could have retired you at 35. You were, that you was were financially the peak. able that to retire. That was the peak, the peak of my career. So you did that in 10 years. Yeah. A little, nine or 10 years. Yeah. Which means that's 1975. Yeah. Okay. So you kept going. More salons? More salons. More salons. Then I got it. And then Geographically, I got it, you're spreading out. Spreading out. And then I was introduced with products, which became another world for me. I created a company called Keratin Complex, which again was another world which revolutionized the beauty industry, which was completely different than what I was doing. And that was another education that I had to learn. I had to learn that business, which was exciting for me. So I met with companies, I met with manufacturers, I met with distributors. I learned that other world. Did you decide to do that because you were interested or because somebody around you was saying, oh, you should get into this? Or was it both? It, it was a combination of both. But you agreed, you felt it, you felt you could help people, you felt like you could have a good product out there. I, that, that would be for real, people would really I was, like it. I was, um, I was fascinated by that part of the, of the industry that was also connected to what I do. I was in the salon business. I wasn't in the product business, but there was always the connection, of course. You needed products. I made the first, <laughs> I made the first flavored shampoos. The first what? Flavored. Cherry, strawberry, banana. I created that. And it, and it exploded, but it exploded within my business. I would be approached by chains of uh, drugstores. We want your product. And I, I couldn't be bothered. I didn't realize you know, because I still was a young guy. I wasn't interested in it. I was too too consumed. I didn't want outside influence to interrupt what I was doing pertaining to the salon business. Wait, this was around 75? 70. This was in the 70s. Did Paul Mitchell already do his thing? Was it already out there? Paul was already out there. Were you? Was, there, was that in the back of your but mind? I, already, like, I had already surpassed him. But not with the products. Not with the products, no. So Paul, was that part of what was going on for you? It was like, well, all right, he did it, so I can do it? No, no nobody was doing it. No, nobody in, in this. His products weren't out there in the 70s? No. Okay. No. It became big when, in the 80s? Probably the 80s, yeah. Okay. Oh, so you, you did the products before Paul he Mitchell, did. of course, lost everything. When I became very, very successful, Paul Mitchell lost everything because he got involved with bad stuff, drugs okay. and this and that. And I felt bad for him. But he came to me uh, really at the peak of my career. I had all the salons going. I had New York going, and he was in he was in a bad way. And I helped him. He said, "But listen, I got an idea." Uh, he was working for a company at the time called Seligman and Latz. They were a corporate mentality, you know, shirt, shirt and tie type thing. Don't forget, at that time, if you could picture Peter, I had long hair, you know, I was you know leather the whole the whole nine yards. It was it was crazy. I can't picture that. It was well, it was crazy time. Yeah. It was it was you know it was crazy. Yeah. So he got involved with, with the corporate world of our business and he hated it. So he came to me and said, listen, I got an idea. I want to come out with a product line and I'm going to leave. I'm going to Hawaii. I said, well, why the world are you going to go to Hawaii? He said, I just got to get out of here. I can't deal with this thing. He says, could you lend me the money and we'll be partners? In Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell. He said, could you lend me the money and we'll be partners? I said, listen, Paul. I said, I'm not interested in the product business. I'm not, yeah, I'm not in the product business. That's one of my great mistakes. That company does $900 million a year now, privately owned, privately owned. And I loved him. He was a terrific guy. Taught me a lot. He was a great, he was a great friend. I said, but I'm not in that business. I said, if you need anything, I'll help you. He said, no. He said, but I, you know, I wanted to come and see you. I wanted to give you my idea. He created the Apui shampoo. He was sell. He went to Hawaii. They were selling the products out of the back of his car. What was it called? Our Pui shampoo. That's how it started. Yeah. Yeah. In Hawaii, he met this John Paul DiGiorgio, a smart guy who I know well. 
and they started this company. And of course, the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, is it owned by his family still? I'm just curious. Well, his son. Uh, yeah, okay. still, his son is still, still mm -hmm. Angus. Okay. Uh, nice, they're nice people. Yeah. They're, good, they're good people. They're good people. It's very cool that you guys came up together. We came it, up together. Just, it really is interesting. Yeah, we came up uh, together. And you both did really well. That's great. Yeah, well, they're you know they're they're a, they're a major force in the beauty yeah. industry. Got they got too commercial for me, you know. But they made a lot of money in doing so. My big thing came with QVC, which was very very interesting. Uh, I was commuting back and forth from New York to Florida. I commuted every week. Back I did that for fifteen years. Monday morning, get on a plane, fly to New York. Work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday night, get on a plane, fly back here to Florida, work Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That was my schedule for 15 years. Never missed a week. Never. Now you know why I'm not married. <laughs> so, and you uh, have a perfect hand. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's been decades in the, in the working. <laughs> so you did that. A, and while you were doing that, you were expanding to down here as well. Oh, yeah. While the QVC thing was was happening, yeah. watch what you're about I've to tell opened, me about. I've opened just in Boca. I've opened eight salons in in my career. Just keep it. Give me the time frame again. So when was QVC? Is it, it the 80s now? Early 90s. Early 90s. Okay, that's a great story. Tell me that story. So uh, a girl that I knew in the industry, her name was Barbara Bush. No, no related to the Bushes. She came to me. She said, "Listen, uh, you would be great on QVC." I said, what's, what's QVC? She said, it's a television program, you know, and she tried to explain it to me. I said, Barbara, I'm not interested. I'm too busy. I don't, I don't have the time to do it. And that was it. She'd call me back the next month. Listen, why don't you come with me? Let me show you what QVC I said, um, I turned her down three times. Finally, I said, okay, what do you want to do? She said, just come with me. Let me take you to QVC, which is in Pennsylvania. I go to QVC. I'm blown away. It's a city, thousands of people. I couldn't believe it. I, I I meet the president of QVC. Her name was Darlene Daggett. She liked me for whatever reason. She thought I was going to be terrific. You go. She said you're going to be a superstar. I said oh, okay. Um, we're going to give you, you come, come up, create a brand. You know, I, I get involved with a manufacturer through Barbara Bush. Uh, I make him a partner in the deal. You're going to manufacture the products, okay? I'm going to give you so much, we're going to, and we're going to take the product line to QVC. Terrific. I designed the line. I kind of knew what, what was out there, and it, it, was, it was a good line, four pieces. It was called Soyogen Complex, Peter Coppola, New York. I go to QVC. I meet, I meet the people. Okay, we're going to order 5,000 of these kits, I said, 5,000? It's going to take forever to sell it. They said, don't worry. <laughs> we're, we're, you're, going to, you're going to be good. That, that's all they told me. You're going to be good. I'm going to meet the host. I met the host, a uh, beautiful girl. And five minutes. You've been on television? I said, yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm comfortable with it. They introduced me. Peter Coppola is in the house, you know, uh, with his new, new soygen complex. And I don't think I said three words. The host says to me, oh, Peter, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you. Now I'm saying to myself, you're done? Yeah, what did I do? Did I, did I do something wrong? So as I'm coming off the air, everybody's clapping. I said, what, what happened? You sold out. I said, wait a minute. What do you mean I sold out? You sold the 5,000 kids. I said, are you kidding? She said, no, we're not kidding. You sold the 5,000 kids. Well, that st started the program uh, at QVC. You get into a thing what they call planned programming, where you have your own hour show. I had my own hour show at QVC, which of course expanded into an enormous amount of people would say to me, Peter, the numbers, that's that's not real. I said, No, those those are real numbers. We reach eighty five million homes on QVC. That's what made me, believe it or not, famous. My business salon, yes, I was famous, but now I became famous where that lady in Des Moines, Iowa, You're was someplace. Eighty-five million homes. She knew. She knew who Peter Coppola was. I tell a funny story. Do we have time to tell it? 
We got time, but don't forget that. So there was another leg to that because you had the other the fifty thousand, the twenty thousand. Oh, New I was Year's on, I was on QVC for five years. They come to me. They say, "Listen, we're going to do a show New Year's Eve." I said, "New Year's Eve? I don't think so." She said, "New Year's Eve." They never did beauty before on New Year's Eve. It was always clothes or jewelry or something like that. So I, I meet with Darlene Daggett and she says, Peter, we think you're going to you're going to hit a home run. I said, yeah, but, you know, you're talking about because we had to lay out the money. You know, it was a lot of money. I said, well, what are we talking about? You know, New Year's Eve. She says, they're going to want 50,000 kits. I said, you must be kidding me. She, says, she said, trust me. I said, OK, uh, I'll tr I'll trust you. Th three, two or three weeks before the show. They call and they want another 25,000 kits in continuity, 75,000 kits. And you're laying the money out. We have to lay the money out. Yeah. She said, don't worry. I mean, if it doesn't do well, but it's going to do well, you know, we'll, we'll sell it out eventually. They were good that way. They didn't, I never lost 10 cents with them, not a dime. I said, okay, darling, you're, I'm okay with it. She said, you're going to be great. I said, okay. I was a little nervous about it. 75,000 kits. Now, uh, when you have a, a, a what they call a today special value, you have from 12 midnight that you go on to 12 midnight. You're on all day long. A lot of work, tremendous amount of work. Because you have 20, 25 models that you have to prep every show. So I had my staff there. You know, you you you're working. You're not yeah, going to sleep. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. It's a it's yeah. a big deal for them too. Yeah, they 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 put out a lot for you too. Because you couldn't buy that. You couldn't buy that exposure. You couldn't. You couldn't pay for it. Forget it. You said eighty-five million people. You said watch, eighty-five watch million that. homes. Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. QVC is unbelievable. And it's probably mostly women. I mean, mostly women. Yeah. Wow. And then you're in other countries. You're in. You're in Germany. You're in France. You're in Australia. Oh, you were selling globally. Yeah. QVC. I went to. I. I. I traveled there to do. The, to do the shows. I'm telling you, I worked. I mean, there so wasn't. You sold out that night. Uh, we, the seventy-five thousand. We sold out. We sold out the seventy-five thousand kits, and in one day, we did three and a half million dollars. Wow! <laughs> Show's over. <laughs> now wow. that was another world to me yeah. that I didn't know. I I learned it, you know, but I learned it from them. They taught me about the products. They taught me about the distribution. They taught me about airtime. But I had a five. I had a five-year run, which was. I mean, we grew we grew that it's brand to, to forty million dollars. And you I, were on QVC, isn't that the time when it was really becoming QVC? It was coming. It was becoming big. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And at the time that I went on, I was only I was the only hair care brand on QVC. They they didn't have any hair. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I was always in the right the right place at the right time. There's something that I read in a book once about the word luck. Like you might say, "Oh, I was lucky," which is, we know is not true. It's uh, it was the, op the the combination of opportunity. And preparedness. Well, it's That's luck. It's interesting that you say that. I, 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 I bring this up at every seminar or meeting that I have with, with people or my staff, and I say to them, "Here's what you have to do. Luck does play a role in it, okay? But before the luck, there's preparation. You need to prepare yourself so when that train comes and the doors open up, you're standing there and you see the train." That's the opportunity, like recognizing the opportunity. Oh, yeah. You know, it's an interesting combination. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we can keep going. We can go on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying you, by the oh, way. Thank you. You're, you're very good at what you do. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, you're good. Thank you. It's our last show ever. We're done. Um, this was fun. And I'm going to invite you to the salon. I, I want to do this at the salon because that could be very exciting. We're, as, we're as a show, to, we are going to do that. Yeah, that could be an exciting show, and I think the the viewer, be a lot of fun. Well, I think the viewer would find it very exciting. You know, for me, the most exciting thing that I did. I mean, I did shows for you know for uh, Ralph Lauren and Giorgio Armani, and and you know the, the first thing they would ask you was you know what is the hair going to look like? You know, your hair for women is your most important accessory. It really, is it's a barometer of who you are. That's why I take it so seriously, and I do. You look good. Your hair's perfect. <laughs> Did you know Versace? Versace? I've met him. Yeah, I've, I, I didn't, I've never done a show for him, but I, I've met him. He was a charming, gentle man. It's a shame what happened to I know, him. I, I just stumbled on a, a documentary on a Showtime or something, and I watched that story. 
his story is just an amazing story and it is just tragic and it was just that's straight up just random the mostly luck. the most you, you want to see a, 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 an, an incredible uh um what's the word i'm looking for uh documentary well yeah it's it's a documentary but it, it's an an emotional documentary and it's about ralph loren you gotta you, if you go online I, i've seen it you've seen it wait is that the show where so his his stuff was like one piece of material that they would well, his story and rap in different ways to make it look like it was multiple people. No, That's his story him. is an amazing story. He's a, he's a, 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 a he's a Jewish boy from the Bronx. Yeah, uh, who, who came from a religious family. I mean, he walled the whole thing, you know, as a young boy. Yeah, and um, he realized. I relate to it very, very much because it's. Uh, I I I relate to it. It's, I can compare it with, with it. And he realized at a very young age that he he wanted to be somebody. And his story is interesting. You know, he started out making ties. I don't know if you know that. I did see this. I, I saw it. You saw that? I did. I saw that the the uh, documentary. Started, he decided yeah. selling it out of a drawer. Yes. And then he brought it to Bloomingdale's, and they said, "We'll buy the ties." And here's a guy who was broke, had no money. Yeah. He said, "Listen, we'll take the ties." That was a big order, Bloomingdale's. I mean, wow. It's huge. Huge. But you can't have your name on the ties. You got to have the Bloomingdale's name on the ties. He said, "No, not going to do it." That that took guts, you know. He stuck to, the guy he who's stuck broke, to his guts. Yeah, you know, but yeah. you know, he 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 knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. When he started the company, he, he went to his friend. He said, "Listen, what what should we call the company? Should we call it uh, uh, what was the word?" Winners, winners, or should we call it polo? So his friend says, polo? Nobody knows about polo. I mean, polo, you know, uh, you, you don't know anything about polo. Winners is, you know, winners. He said, okay. He said, hang up. He said, well, polo. No, polo. <laughs> you want to be different. He, well, he had a vision. Yeah. Without the vision, you're not going anywhere. I relate that to myself. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for yeah. sure. But he had, he had he's had an amazing an amazing career uh, of, of of his idea. It wasn't about selling clothes. He sold a lifestyle. He took you to Africa. He took you to the Hamptons. He he. It wasn't just a mannequin with his clothes on it. He gave you a story, which at the time nobody was doing it, and the clothes that he was making you couldn't buy in a store. He took the concept of, you know, Fred Astaire, Gary Cooper, you know, those guys, how they dressed in the movies. It's a fascinating story, which I relate to very much so. And the story, like you mentioned, like the story, the brand is the story. The story is the brand. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. We, what do you got? I can't see across it. Ralph Lauren. <laughs> so I, 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 I really relate to him. And I've done shows. He's a... He's a He's a very unusual guy, very down to earth, but he controls that company. It's his vision. But it's more than that. It's, it's his life. And he I, wants perfection. Yeah. The attention to detail. He has a group of people working for him, maybe 40, 50 designers that design the clothes. And then he has a sticker. This is true, by the way. And that sticker has his initial on it. So he will look at the clothes and say, okay, I like that, I like the pattern. I want the lapel to be maybe a little thinner. I want this done this way, I want that done way. And when all of that is done, that sticker goes, It's good. Done. It's good. You know, when we were talking earlier before we started recording, I said to you, I do this show to motivate people, you know, to inspire people, hopefully to help people. You talked about, and you talked about sacrifice, creativity, the three D's: discipline, determination, uh, desire. I mean, I wrote so many things down when you were talking. Gratitude, which we didn't spend enough time on, but that's a huge, huge part of success, um, and being happy. Um, it's the key at the core, the core of like what success is: being yeah. happy, having a direction, having a vision. Um, I can't read my own handwriting with some of these things. I couldn't write as fast as you were talking. There's so much interesting stuff. That is why we do this show. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm so 
appreciative that you came on and you did this today. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you for the word. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I can't thank you enough. You know, like I said earlier, we pass here. It's a very short period of time. It really is when you think about it. I mean, I've, I've lived already my life. Whatever years I have left, I'm, I'm grateful for. And I've been so fortunate in, in, in life. Uh, and, and like I said about the movie, just be grateful and be kind. It's easy. It's easy. That's, it. it's, all, that's, it. that's all it is. That's it. Yeah. Look at that camera for a sec. This guy right here, we end every show by talking about being humble and hustling. This is it. Thank you. He's humble. And he's hustled for his entire life. And it's the messages on this on this show with you have been just powerful. Thank you. Thank I you. enjoyed Thank this. I enjoyed this very much. This I is, really this did. This is one of the best shows. Thank I you. I feel bad saying it, but it's uh, it's, thank it's you. so interesting. Like, what a story. Yeah. So thank you again. Hey. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. you for the, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. We're gonna do it again soon. <laughs>